Good day, folks. I'd like to explain to you how apparently we're all running the Bedini devices wrong, and I'd like to show you my modification to the process and how it would really enhance the effects of the Bedini here by simply transferring it to a one-wire system. Now, um, as you've seen in some of my previous projects, I use various oscillators to trigger the condition. Even in some instances using native 60 Hz, it will work with a microwave transformer. However, more difficult at 60 Hz because you got to use bigger sized equipment. And of course, the effect is more pronounced at high frequency. So it's better to build your own oscillators to trigger it. But with that said, even a solid state oscillator, a chip and thin integrated circuit, anything will always complete a loop at the input side. So as little milliamps as it is, even a free running oscillator will always require the input to give it a bias current to trigger it. So what goes on is, um, there's always a loop going on, so, but in the sense of the Bedini, we're using the fan blades to, to create that. So what happens is when we start the Bedini here, we put an initial burst of current, it gets the wheel spinning, and from that point on, we're recycling that, that G-force, and that does take care of our triggering because of the way the coils are set up. Every time the magnet aligns, it flips the polarity and triggers the bias and switches the transistor. So this way here, we don't have to pay for additional power in the continuous switching as long as the wheel keeps spinning. So that's the key here of the Bedini systems that we like to take advantage of. Now everybody takes the back EMF side with the help of a flyback diode, and then they either charge a set of batteries or capacitor dumps or whatever with this. But the issue is when you're doing that, in a sense, you're still closing the loop. And let me explain what happens here. And this is the reason why we can't simply self-loop it back into the input as is because you create a path through the coil and the diode and you end up having a complete dead short and that cuts that literally short so you can't self loop it in this method you have to figure out other ways of doing it so with that said let me explain a little bit here so when you magnetize the coils you have to pay for that input as little as it is every trigger there's a remagnetization process now what happens is the inducer is sort of like the magnetic equivalent of a battery when you pulse it. So what happens when we, we collect the inductive kickback, we're taking the energy of the demagnetization process. So what happens is at the next pulse, you're gonna have to spend a little bit more input energy into the magnetization. So as little as it is, you're still using input trigger, and as you start going into the high frequencies, 1K and more, those accumulate a lot. So even if you look at the big Bedini setups here that he had, when he had the meters measuring it as great as it was folks i saw that meter flickering at around 1.5 amp as a result of always having to remagnetize the system as efficient as that is of course 1.5 amps input and you're charging four five six batteries it's a no-brainer right but the thing is, do we really need to use that much current? And the answer is no. We could bring that down literally into the milliamp ranges if we wanted to by simply modifying the way the system works. What happens is a lot of people get confused in the free energy community because with these motors and similars, when you short out the back EMF and the motor appears to speed up and, and um, use less current, so people simply jump to the conclusion and they say, hey, it's over unity, it's giving more output, it's giving more torque, but it's not like that at all because this is actually, when you short it out in these devices, you're creating a state of hysteresis. And basically in that state, it's very similar to um, reactive power. It's not real power. So um, Bedini realized he couldn't do, you know, it's not traditional load powering, but because when you short it out, it speeds it up, it, he decided to take advantage of the state because batteries are very low impedance. So when you connect a battery to the thing or more, it almost looks like a dead short. The thing speeds up, works more efficiently. And at the same time, as a side effect, charges the batteries really, really quickly. So it's not an effect, you know, pure inductive kickback running the show it's this i guess john wasn't able as he stated he had to say back emf in his patents for it to uh, get accepted but there's more at play here so anyways i'm going to show you this i've modified the system here this is the back emf side 
And because I'm running a small Bedini motor, I had to use a little transformer right here. It's a high voltage transformer, really miniature. So this is my back EMF side driving the transformer. So as I was saying, it's a lot best, like in my case with this small one here, let's say traditionally it'll take 100, 100 milliamps or so at its optimal setting to charge an array of batteries, as good as that is, if we can bring it down to like 25 milliamps instead and it does the same thing, folks, that's like a 75%, you know, efficiency increase. So it's just stupid to not do it that way, right? So right now I have it on my 12 volt battery here and I will um, show you how this works crudely here. So what I have here is the little high frequency transformer, high voltage. And on one side, I've got the two, uh, sorry, the one wire system with the two diodes. And that's what I use to charge a, nine, a dead nine volt battery with here. And by doing it this way here, we're keeping the loop open at all times. And this energy that's hitting the battery electron wise has nothing to do with what's hitting the battery. We're completely decoupled now unlike the uh, traditional back EMF charging. We're just using it as a trigger to uh, create a potential difference against ground on the uh, second uh, high voltage output pin here, which just goes to my ground here. So first I will turn this on and I will show you without the ground to show you what happens here. So I'll turn the meter on and I've got it connected to the um, output of the uh, two, the one wire two diodes here all right so i'm going to turn it on first without the uh, ground connected and i'm going to show you i've got the meter on this output here and i've got the scope as well connected here to show you so we're going to turn it on right now by giving it power so i'm going to spin the wheel Let's start it up there we go and i look at the meter and you know not really an impressive setup like this, so this is why if some people would have experimented, they may not have right away jumped to the conclusion that there's anything there. Because what we're doing is, we're, I guess basically it's creating potential against itself, which isn't very much, and some people have noted you want to have a counterpoise ground, either a real ground, or as heavy of a mass as you can to change this. But needless to say, it's acting as a trigger right now, we're not spending any extra in the input for this. So I'm going to try and tune it, needless to say, here for the best we can get here. 570, 536, so more around here, okay? So we adjusted the uh, resistance on here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert the ground. What we want to do is create a true potential difference is only with the ground. And of course, this will charge capacitors and batteries. So here I'm connecting the ground. And look what happened to our voltage all of a sudden. So I could finally uh, tune in some more. That seems like a pretty good range there. So 37 volts. And then look what happens though if I were to put a second ground, let's say this would be a distant ground, I'm going to use my body as a counterpoise, but if we're on the other side of this diode here, I touch it, look what happens. 94 volts. And we're not even stressing because this is just using as a trigger, it makes no difference, I can short this one out, it's not, a, it's not doing anything to our input. So there's our 96 volts. My, my, my body is simulating a second earth ground here. You could use a heavy mass as well. But we're essentially getting the near 100 volts output we would get with the radian direct, but instead of coupling directly into it and loading it, you know, a bigger version to about 1.5 amps, I'm loading it maybe in the milliamps because it's not taking the load. Now let's see how much, I'm not touching it no more, just as is like that. I'm gonna try and fine tune it here. Okay, so let's look at the scope to see what's going on. And I'm gonna put the battery on, okay? So now we're gonna charge the battery with this and we're gonna see the dead voltage of the battery show up. So now we're charging the battery with this, okay? So let's see what's hitting the battery, okay? Take a look at this. 
68 volts is hitting the battery it's not even the effect usually you know it goes up really down you know to 24 volts or so once it hits the load of the battery but not with this setup here so the half cycle would be uh, 28 volts so essentially we're hitting the battery at almost 30 volts so yeah it's gonna move folks essentially we're getting the same result as coupling into it directly without loading down the input at all. So we're getting the same effect, but much more efficient. And of course, some people will ask, can you self loop it? <laughs> yes, with great difficulty. I've shown that with uh, various movies about eight months ago. It's very difficult. Uh, you have to have the timing correct. It's fanatic to operate. It always varies. But, you know, if you want to fiddle with it for about a month like I did before getting the video with great difficulty, and when you do self-loop it, the problem is you end up losing like 98% of it. Yes, in some cases with my 12-volt battery, I was able to observe modest increases using the one battery setup, but it was pretty slow and needless to say, I wasn't able to charge additional batteries while doing it because I was dedicating everything to the self-loop, at least this way here. We can charge all of our batteries we want, even parallel some, and the thing is we're using the true potential of the ground here to create a difference and we're triggering it with the high frequency of the Bedini motor, that's it. And we're not directly coupled into it, we're just using it as a trigger and we're essentially getting the same effect at 75% better efficiency. So this is in my way, I think the way we should be running Bedini systems and I've never seen anyone running them in this configuration before and it only makes sense to do that so here's our nice pulse coming back in and you know this is while the battery is on you know and it's tapping right here right at the one wire that's the scope probe and it's pretty high frequency too around 1k so the high frequency makes it better because that's more clicks a second which means more of that precious energy potential difference can get into the battery but this all has to be pulsed you can't just do a system like this on DC against it just doesn't work that way so anyways I hope you enjoyed that was just the point I was trying to make how to properly operate our Bedini motors we used a one wire system folks